Hey, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. I do not think there is a more ubiquitous terrain build than my three by three foam dungeon tiles. They were my claim to fame, a very early project video that helped launch this channel. And to this day, you can't go into a tabletop hobby group without seeing somebody posting their version of these tiles that they built. They're easily the most useful thing you can build for miniature based tabletop RPGs. And they're beginner friendly. They're kind of the perfect little project. And that's why in all these years, I've never come back and made them again. I still have and use this same original set I made six years ago, I think. I made them before I had a hot wire cutter uh, and before I figured out the Mod Podge coating. These are old school, cut with a knife and just painted. And they've held up really well, even to this day. I've seen a lot of use and they still don't need replacing. I did wonder though, if I were to make these again now, knowing everything that I know, how much different would they turn out? So I did exactly that. I came at this project all over again, no longer a hobby crafting noob, just to see if they turn out any different. One place the old tiles could be improved was their weight. Small foam squares are light and easily disrupted, which makes them kind of a pain in game. This time around, I wanted to base my tiles on something with a bit of weight. I also wanted a substrate so that I could make each square an individual piece of foam. I had these small square MDF craft pieces from Dollarama that were just about perfect. The one downside was the size. They weren't a perfect three inch by three inch square and I wanted to use them as is without cutting. This wasn't a deal breaker. It just meant that I'd have to make the grid slightly larger than one inch, which is something I like anyway, as one inch grids can be kind of tight with modern miniatures. It worked out that these would break up into 28 millimeter squares, which is a great grid size, just slightly larger than one inch, but not so large that it looks obviously different. I love the inch and a quarter grid system myself Itself, but it does kind of look oversized. I had to cut a lot of 28 millimeter tiles. So the hot wire cutter came in very handy. I also switched to different foam. On the originals, I used half inch foamular because you can get it off the shelf at Home Depot and it's already a great thickness. But now I have access to denser foam that holds impressions much better and comes in thicker formats. I'll put a link to my foam supply store in the video description. If you look at a block of foam like this, it's important to know that certain sides take impressions better than others. You have to consider that foam like this is cut out of much larger sheets. They manufacture them in panels that are like four foot by eight foot. And there's actually three different sides or faces to them, you have the factory face. This is the side that's been pressed by the machine. And if you're looking at a four by eight sheet, it's the side that's gonna have all the text and everything on it. And then you have what's the cross cut. That's the edge that is created when you cut across the sheet. What's important is that the elasticity of each side is slightly different. When you're trying to make impressions on foam, you're gonna indent them. And depending on how elastic it is, that's gonna determine how well it holds that texture. The end cuts and the cross cuts are more elastic and hold impressions much worse than the factory face. This is the densest direction of the foam and it holds impressions really well. So you wanna identify the best side and cut your pieces in such a way that the face of your tiles will use the best face of the foam, the factory face. I cut down logs of foam that were 28 millimeters square, ensuring that the good factory side of the foam would end up as the ends of these logs. Once I had a bunch of these made, I sliced them at a chosen thickness, leaving me with the best faces for taking texture. And for thickness, I decided on 10 millimeter. This was just a convenient thickness for quickly setting up the guide and when placed on the MDF would be a similar thickness to my old tiles in case I wanted to use them together. Eventually I had a ton of these squares, but they were so sharp and clean. I needed to break out a fancy old school BMC tool, the coffee can full of stones. This is my simple homemade rock tumbler. It's great. You throw some foam bricks in it and shake it around for 30 seconds and it breaks all the hard edges and gives some texture, leaving you with pieces that better resemble stone. Even with a pile of around 200 squares, this whole process only took about five minutes. And no, using an actual rock tumbler is not more efficient. It doesn't give an extreme texture and I wanted a rougher surface, more like flagstone or slate. This is where the higher density foam shines. 
If you take a rock and smush it into the foam, it leaves a lovely strong impression. It's important to note that I'm doing this before applying the pieces. This way they can be mixed up. If you do this after they're glued in place, it's gonna create indents that carry over from one stone to the next, making them no longer look like individual slabs. The 28 millimeter size I chose actually made the layout slightly larger than the MDF squares, which is good. They would overhang a tiny bit and hide that MDF from view. To make sure they overhung evenly on all edges, I marked the center of the squares. Then I aligned the center stone by placing its four corners on the diagonal lines. After that, the rest could just be dropped in in any order. I used hot glue for this because I wanted an instant bond and there would be zero risk of warping the MDF, which you might get with a water-based glue. These did basically look like my original tiles, just nicer, more three-dimensional. I wanted to kick them up a tiny notch by adding some fun details. I picked through a bits box, grabbing some skulls, skeletons, shields, swords, chains, axes, and whatnot to litter the dungeon floor with. It was important that none of these details protruded out too much. I didn't want them interfering with miniatures or terrain that was standing on them. Thankfully, I could just push them into the foam and glue them in place, making them mostly flush. Before I get to painting, I wanna tell you about this video's sponsor, Into the AM. Into the AM makes awesome clothing, specifically t-shirts, but also things like hats. They even make hoodies, joggers, and shorts. They have a constantly updating line of interesting graphic prints, as well as basic tees, which I highly recommend if you want something soft, comfy, and well-fitting that won't shrink in the dryer. The artwork is always super bold and eye-catching, and it's professionally screen printed, so the designs hold up with every wash. I mean it, these shirts are very comfy. They're soft, and they fit well. What more do you want? Check out their site and browse the designs, but be sure to use the link in my description to get there as it will give you an additional 10% discount on your entire order at checkout. Cheers to Into the AM. Thanks for sponsoring this video. Now back to the build. So I decided not to Mod Podge coat these tiles either. The original ones were fine without it and this foam is even denser. Plus I wanted to keep all the texture as crispy as possible. I opted for a polyurethane airbrush primer since it sticks well to the foam and the various plastic types on the bits. I highlighted them with white ink, but this wasn't really a Zenithal highlight like you'd use on a model. I didn't spray from top down. That would have just completely covered them since they're essentially flat. Instead, I lightly sprayed from each side at a low angle. I wanted to achieve the same effect that dry brushing would give me, just with a smoother finish than brushing on craft paint. I wasn't sure what to do about color. I wanted them to be gray and generic enough to use in any dungeon, but I wanted some interesting undertone. I tried out an undercoat of forest green, as well as one with raw umber. The green looked cool, but wouldn't fit in as many settings, so I opted for the brown. I finished the paint job by hand and brought back a lot of the highlight details by dry brushing on some fog gray craft paint. I was careful to use a very minimal amount of paint here, keeping my brush quite dry. I didn't want any paint streaks, just that dusty scuffed rock surface look. And since I had all these bits in place, I needed to paint them out afterwards. This was a pretty quick task though, just some metallics, a brown contrast for the wood bits, and a bone white on the skulls and skeletons. They looked great as is, but I felt they would be pushed just a bit further with an oil wash. I mixed up a black brown oil wash and covered everything. Of course, this really darkens them up, but that's what these oil washes do. You just need to wait for them to dry and come back with a makeup sponge dipped in some thinner to remove the oil paint from all the highest surfaces. This brings things back to life, leaving the grime and shadow only in the lowest recesses. I finished them off with a coat of matte varnish because I didn't want them to look shiny and wet at all. I didn't paint out or finish the bottom sides just because I'm not sure what I want to do yet. Of course, you could paint them, you could put some felt on them, you could put some magnets in them. A lot of people are tempted to use magnets like this to lock tiles together. I don't really like that. I find that a bit finicky. What I might do though is put some magnets on the underside and use them on a metal play surface so they stay in place. These tiles turned out awesome. I really love the way they look. The goal was just to recreate an early project, but with an improved skill set. What's interesting is that fundamentally they're the same. They don't look that much different, but they look nicer. They look better. It's exactly what you want when revisiting a project like this. 
Now, if you don't have the stuff needed to make this version of the tiles, you can just make the original basic dungeon tile style that so many people have used and loved over the years. So what do you guys think? I hope you enjoyed me revisiting an old project. Is this something you'd like me to do again? If so, what old project would you like me to retry now? If you liked the video, hit the like button. Let me know in the comments section below. If you want to pick up some tools or supplies, be sure to use blackmagiccraft.ca. There I have my essential equipment page with all of the tools that I use regularly. And again, if you want to get some of this really good foam, I'll put a link in the description. Last, if you like these videos and you want to help me keep making them, the best way you can do that is by supporting the channel on Patreon. I'd love to have you as the newest member of the Black Magic Craft Fellowship. That's it. That's all. Cheers. See you again next time.